Okay, we're live. Hello, and welcome to Honey Badger Hangout. My name is Allison Tiemann, otherwise known as Typhon Blue, and with me today is Karen Strong, otherwise known as Girl Rights What, and Hannah Wallen. Also with us today is Rachel Edwards, our new recent recruit to the dark side. Today's Hi, topic. <laughs> <laughs> Today's topic is rain, or as we like to call them, the rape apologizing ideology. Ide huh. Boy, this is a tongue twister. The rape apologizing, the rape apologizing ideolo <laughs> ideology negating nasties. Before we get started, I'd like to direct you all to our website at www.honeybadgerbrigade.com. From there, you can link to our blog and our YouTube ar archives. Consider donating to the Honey Badger cause and help us spread our vile message of true equality further. Or volunteer if you have WordPress or promotional skills. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash user slash Honey Badger Radio. And add Honey Badger Radio to your Google Plus circles at plus.google.com slash plus symbol Honey Badger Radio. When we get to 1,000 in our fan circle, we'll be throwing a Google Plus party and inviting you all. Finally, you can find more information about this show, such as links and additional content, at blog.honeybadgerbrigade.com. Now here's Hannah with the news. Halifax has seen an invasion of Don't Be That Guy posters that tell men not to rape, that tell all men not to rape. An anonymous individual has illustrated the wrongness of that generalization with posters of their own. The posters turn the man-hating message of don't be that guy on its ear with slogans like just because it's your baby doesn't mean it's your trash and just because it can fit in your purse doesn't mean you can take it. Feminists have predictably, predictably responded with outrage. Feminists have called police over the posters and the Mounties are currently investigating. Isn't it horrible when you implicate a whole gender for the crimes of a few? And now for a review of a seminal historical art piece. Oh, did I say seminal? I meant vaginal. Martha Rossler's Semiotics of the Kitchen, produced 1975. In this, Mar Martha Rossler picks up an implement of kitchen-based labor and says it's oh, made acting out its use. This evokes the horror of being a white wealthy woman whose husband is rich enough to afford her a life of leisure in which she is asked to labor the equivalent of one self-directed part-time job. Despite the fact that the class obligated to labor least is usually the privileged class of a society and despite the fact that other privileged classes manage to invent science and philosophy and sculpture in their leisure time, the housewife is both oppressed and cut off from human endeavor against her will, leading to a sense of ennui and apathy, which, of course, is the fault of the patriarchy. The sense of tedium was captured by the excessively long intro shot of our heroine holding up the title card. The sense of disconnection of captured by her wild thrusts with the fork, nearly toppling her over in sharp contrast with her monotone call or call evokes the patriarchy's expectation that women swallow swallow their emotions, and yet it condemns them for the self-referential yeah. spasmodic hysteria that results from said swallowing. We do not want to swallow, women cry, and the patriarchy says, you must swallow and keep swallowing, and women swallow and swallow, finding reprieve only in swallowing Valium or spitting up some of the patriarchy's coagulated poison in rage subliminated into fitful motions with the hands and feet. A link to Semiotics of the Kitchen can be found in the show notes on our blog at blog.honeybadgerbrigade.com. Now, let's get back to our topic, how rain is a bunch of rape-apologizing, uh, ideology-negating nasties. <laughs> oh, for those of you who don't um, know... First, I just want to say, I had, no, I had no idea that Allison's alter ego split personality Raven Moon Dragon would be showing up today. No idea at all. Raven, <laughs> behave yourself. All right, wait for your turn to talk. 
That's hey, not misogyny. That's, that's, that's just what? good manners. No, I'm not. You can't inflict the patriarchy on me, lady. You, you vagina traitor. <laughs> I'm not. Go I'm not gonna. No, I'm gonna talk when I want to talk, not when you want me to talk. Okay, that is patriarchy. That is patriarchy. Okay. Uh, I told. Patriarchy. You. Patriarchy. <laughs> patriarchy. Okay, so rain has is, is patriarchy a function of mathematics or is it a patriarchy ahead. a function? Of no, patriarchy is a function of uh, pastries make my ass fat, therefore it must be patriarchy doing it. And, uh, you know, patriarchy makes these delicious pastries, oh. and then patriarchy blames me for my ass getting fat with, with the beauty ideal. Therefore, you know, I'm oppressed. Anyway. Right. So, uh, um... <laughs> I thought most pies were made by women. Most pies are made by... Well, but, but that's because they are... They, that's uh, that's bargaining with patriarchy. You see, if they don't oh, make right. the okay. pies, okay. the uh, you know patriarchy fuckface will get them. You know the the uh, the thug of patriarchy. I don't know. Let's let's move on to Rain because this is getting this is okay. getting too ridiculous. Um, so Rain actually put or uh, or did a press release in which they called out rape apology or uh, rape culture uh, if the rape culture of feminist imagining. And explicitly said that rape isn't a result of people um, of, of a rape culture of, of a culture that condones rape. Rape is a, is the individual choices of a small number of men. And of course, this is this is uh, created a lot of hysteria in from the usual suspects. But uh, yeah, yeah, Karen, I know that you uh, you have a lot to say on this subject, so jump right in. Well, you know, I like I, I think. As far there, there is an argument to be made as to uh, whether um, whether perpetrators are getting away with it uh, or not. But I think that the primary reason why uh, men who rape get away with it is because uh, women who are raped don't report it, and I think that that's a more complex issue. And that that you know that's a more complex complex issue than feminists want to admit, and that they contribute to it in ways that I'm sure that they really don't want to. Um, if I believed feminists and their entire rhetoric on, you know, how difficult it is to report and how grueling a process it is and how I'd be re-victimized and how he's not going to, he's not going to serve any time anyway, he's just going to be let off the hook, um, it's all, all going to be, all of that grief and trauma and re-victimization is going to be for nothing, right? I wouldn't freaking report it. Why would I? Right? What? Why would I put myself through that? So I think that they're perpetuating a climate uh, just through their rhetoric in which women are discouraged from reporting, and uh, and the fact that they treat any sense of skepticism uh, of any you know any given claim, right? That that that's basically what's discouraging women from reporting, rather than saying okay, the veracity of any claim needs to be tested. The veracity of claims of heinous wrongdoing needs to be tested uh, more rigorously than, you know, like, if you're talking about this guy stole a pen from work, right, and the punishment for that is, you know, he, he gets, uh, I don't know, he has to put $10 in petty cash, right? Uh, the, you know, the claim doesn't necessarily demand the same rigor of uh, testing for veracity as saying, you know, like if somebody says that guy murdered somebody, I'm going to want to know that there's a dead body out there somewhere. I'm going to want to know before I make a judgment on what he did that that he's actually uh, that the crime was committed and that he's actually guilty of it. Um, and that you find this again and again and again that that the more you increase the perceived seriousness of the crime, the more you increase the punishment for the crime, the more reluctant people are to convict on less evidence, right? They, they want to have definitive proof, right, that a crime's been committed and that the person who's been charged is guilty before they will send somebody away for 20 years and brand them with that, you know, the red R, the scarlet R. Uh, people don't want to uh, basically 
put someone away for that amount of time based on a yeah well he may, maybe probably did it but we're not 100 percent sure and i think that's a healthy attitude to take um so like but feminists will call that rape apology they'll call that excusing rapists they'll call that letting men get away with rape right and the reality is uh that's not rape apology any more than what i said in my panel discussion with naomi wolf was rape apology right that the reason why uh, the conviction rate may be lower for rape than for other crimes or the attrition rate is because it's an extremely difficult claim to prove because it generally happens in a situation where there are no corroborating witnesses. It usually happens in private. It usually happens in a dating or acquaintance scenario where uh, you might reasonably expect two people to have sexual relations, at least in this day and age, right? And And that all it is based on is two people's states of mind, her lack of consent and his awareness of that. And when you're talking about a crime that occurs merely as a, a state of mind, that, that the only thing that separates it from a perfectly legal act is a state of mind, um, you're going to have trouble proving that, right? And the fact that that feminists have eliminated so many of the additional things that you would need, right? You know, you used to need cor corroborating witnesses and you used to need evidence, physical evidence of resistance, right? They've eliminated that. You don't need that anymore. And now it's just entirely based on those two states of mind. So of course it's going to be hard to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, right? And instead of feminists saying, okay, well, it's hard to prove because of concrete, physical, normal, logical reasons, right? They want to uh, reduce due process, erode due process, reduce the burden of proof, right? To make it easier to convict people of crimes just based solely on somebody's word, right? Because it's just the nature of the crime that makes it difficult to prove. So and that... anybody who actually says it's the nature of the crime itself, you know, that makes it difficult to prove, they call you a rape apologist. So essentially what they want to do is they want to create this crime with incredible consequences, both socially and legally, and they want women to have the ability to inflict those consequences on their word. No questioning of uh, just this assumption that women somehow do not lie that women ha somehow are, are infallible, that they don't have human foibles, that they won't lie for their own benefit or for revenge. And it's, it is, it, and you're right, they have this belief that due process or any sort of skepticism that a horrible crime a a occurred is in fact rape culture. And what's really funny is that I've gotten, yeah. I've actually gotten into arguments with feminists on this and I've said, if the, if the, if the government was eroding due process, which is what's happening in, in crimes of rape. If the government was eroding due process for treason and for terrorism, so if it was, if, if it was eroding due process for those crimes, uh, would you be arguing with me, if, 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 if this wasn't rape, this was about terrorism or, or treason, that due process has changed, has become less, has been lessened for those two crimes, would you be sitting here arguing that questioning what's going on with rape is a bad thing, or what, what's going on in the legal process in regards to due process for rape is a bad thing, and they could never answer. They said, no, that's different. It's not different. There is no special crime that requires its own type of due process. It all should be subject to the same, the same process. And if, if rape is, it should be considered separately from other crimes, it should be considered separately in terms of the amount of stigma that comes with a rape accusation. Not making it easier. I've, I've, I've actually put this forward, and this is really controversial, that conviction rates for rape may be too high because it is a crime. Uh, yeah. It is a crime in which it's basically one, word, one person's word against another, and all of the evidence is identical to a consensual activity that happens how many times a day? So it's... And um, and also, I'm just going to throw something out there about the historical situation for rape because people come and they come up with all kinds of ridiculous stuff about how people 
in a history dealt with rape. Um, during the Victorian time, the conviction rate of rape when it was a woman who was a lower class who was bringing a charge of rape forward was the same as it is now for all cases of rape. And the conviction rate for a woman who was upper class was double that, what it is today. So historically people have, are, are the legal system has treated the crime of rape very seriously and probably way too seriously considering that their forensic evidence back then was was well, what was it? It was non-existent, basically. So, in a lot of ways, these these men were being convicted on the word of women alone. And so, it's ne well. You sorry, go ahead, Carol. Ahead, Karen. You, you or actually, had to have something. It and the, well, the majority of men freed, exonerated by the Innocence Project, were convicted of sex crimes, right? You know, like how many men are convicted of sex crimes compared to other crimes and how many of those exonerations, what's the proportion of exonerations that are sex crimes and it's because we're desperate to, uh, you see it in cases like the Duke LaCrosse case uh, where Mike Nifong uh, ended up being disbarred and disciplined uh, for prosecutorial misconduct, uh, you know, malicious prosecution because he was desperate and the public was desperate to uh, to get vengeance on these boys that they believe had committed this heinous act, right? And I think that I think out of the ten most famous exonerations in Canada, eight of them involved uh, had a sexual element. Some of them involved murder as well, but but eight out of the ten involved rape as well as murder. And all almost all of them were male on female crime. And it's one of the things. Uh... I wanted to make a note of real quick, and um, you bringing up the Innocence Project actually really drives it home because the Innocence Project has has um, has actually exonerated some women, but it's when it comes to sex crimes and wrongful conviction in sex crimes that is almost always men, and uh, and that's you know going right back to um, if if they wanted to apply the, the same standards to terrorism, break down due process for terrorism crime, or uh, break down due process for treason. Um, one of the most really telling things about the feminist attitude toward this crime is that if you want to apply the standards for which they have fought, the reduction in due process, having evidence not be admissible in court, um, all of the things that they have demanded when a woman makes an accusation go out the window when we're talking about an accused woman. So even though they they claim that this crime is unique and significant and, and there should be this change of standard for how we handle it, as soon as you start talking about a male accuser and, and a female who's been accused, they don't want to do that anymore. And it's not as much about the crime as it is about the gender of the accused and the gender of the accuser. Mm. Well, well, what well, Hannah's saying... this way. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Oh, what Hannah's saying is actually one of the things I wanted to talk about, which is um, you have a lot of women, they are going through uh, the court system, and there's a mountain of evidence against them that they've raped young boys or or an, or a man and then they completely you know they get up, let off with a slap on the wrist they will never see jail time and you never see that for a man doing the same crime at all well of course, of course not right because because men are dangerous women are just misguided or or they, uh, women who do those things, they, they were just troubled, or they, uh, they slipped through the cracks, or there weren't enough people out there to help them, or they had mental issues, or you know, they were a victim of something. Uh, maybe they're abused as children, and that's a mitigating factor. And you know, so it, it's just like, but there are no mitigating factors for men who commit these crimes. And when there are, and I remember uh, distinctly a case in the UK where it was an uh, adult man who's quite a bit older, Annie, I think she was 15 years old, and mm -hmm. the judge basically said, and the whole idea that a 15-year-old girl cannot be predatory, that, that a 
15 year old girl cannot seek sex when she wants it. Um, but the judge said she was older than her chronological age and that she actively and aggressively pursued sex with this man, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, those should be mitigating factors when it came not to his guilt, but to the sentence that he should serve, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody just flipped their shit, right? <laughs> so, you know, and, and as far as I'm concerned, like, if a 16-year-old high school student, a uh, high school boy, and I do believe a 16-year-old high school boy could potentially aggressively pursue sex with a teacher or with uh, a, say, a friend's mother, um, and and that that should be a mitigating factor if she, like, if she wasn't the one doing the pursuing, right? I, I think that that should be a mitigating factor, not regarding her guilt, but regarding her sentence, regarding the level or the percentage of culpability that she has, because 16-year-old boys can be very aggressive in pursuing sex, right? Having been a teenager before, right, I know this. I Just like I know it, having been a teenager before, I know it regarding women, right? So, you know, I, I really... Having having a teenage boy aggressively pursuing sex with an adult woman is not the same thing as an adult woman singling out a teenage boy and grooming him and emotionally manip manipulating him into a position where he's going to consent to sex when he otherwise would not have. Right? And I think the same thing applies in the other direction as well. Well, so, go ahead, that, Allison. Yeah, that occur something occurs from that. I mean, I, I don't know if I can... I, I, maybe mitigating circumstances in terms of sentencing... Uh, I'm not sure if I'm completely on board on that, but I'd have to think about it a bit longer. But there was something else I wanted to bring up that actually puts that whole scenario into a, a, a much more stark uh, contrast, which is um, when you look at the... There was one study of teen violence, teen sexual violence. You find that um, young... These teenage girls, these underage teenage girls, are actually physically forcing older men into having sex or even coercing them into having sex and it's not even as an aggressive pursuit it's 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 what feminists would call rapey if it was women or men doing it to women uh, or or it is actual li literal rape that they're physically forcing these men to have sex or they are coercing them with you know threats of oh if you don't do this then I'll say that you raped me or that you had sex with me and the reality is in this case with the law and the legal system, the social system as it is, those men who are effectively raped or coerced by teenage girls into having sex, and this is this is a statistical reality, you look at the statistics, this is happening, would be the ones who would go to jail for statutory rape. And that's something that I think that applies to yes. what you're saying there, Karen, is, is if you're looking at a situation where the, the, the younger party is not just aggressive but criminal, in their acts, there has to be some, I mean, it, it's all sort of, it's much more nuanced and, and shades of gray. And these are the kinds of things that feminists do not talk about. They, they make everything so black and white. And in the case of, uh, of what Rain was saying, um, I, I, wanna, I wanted to point out something that you said um, a while back about, about the uh, don't be that girl. And it's interesting how this all ties it back into the don't be that guy campaign. Uh, the don't be the guy campaign that's telling all men not to rape. And then you you pointed out, you Karen pointed out um, Dr. Lissick's work that found out found that actually the majority of the rapes are being done by a very uh, unrepentant, very criminal minded minority of men at around like three percent of men. And, and that's not including the, the women who are doing it. So it, this is just male and female rape, not male, not female and male rape. So when you look at that, what what um, what Rain is saying is exactly what you're saying: that there is a small minority of men who are doing the raping, and we cannot look at this situation the way the feminists look at it in terms of culture encouraging this when it's a, just a criminal minority that's engaging in it. And it's actually what Rain is doing, uh, sorry, what feminist rape culture does is normalize um, normalize rape as a masculine activity. That, and they do this repeatedly. I see the feminists doing this constantly. I mean, 
if you look at uh, if you look at uh, Justin Detention International and the recent feminist interview with uh, Just Detention International's um, their current uh, head, that that woman who is the current head of Just Detention International said essentially that rape is a is a is a is a is a, is a function of of masculinity, either um, hypermasculine spaces or toxic masculinity or proving your masculinity or hegemonic masculinity, that rape is a function of masculinity. And don't be that guy emphasizes that. And um, and the reality is that rape is is a minority of men. And then that's not even counting the 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 number of rapists who are female. And it's it's a framing that not only marginalizes victims of female rapists, but it also shames men for uh, behavior that is not masculine. It has nothing to do with masculinity. It's non-gendered. And I'm going to hand the mic over to Hannah. She's been waiting patiently. Or no, to Rachel, because she's been waiting patiently to speak. So go oh. ahead, Rachel. Well, one of the things I really wanted to bring up was that a lot of the things that people don't think about when they think about rape is that you do have underage offenders. You have people who are uh, young teens or even preteens who will get involved in that sort of crime. And yet when we talk about things like statutory rape we think, oh, they can't possibly you know, have done something like this. They can't have possibly have pursued uh, an older woman or man. And uh, you know, they just don't ever talk about that. This is, they always think about it being something specifically that you know, men do to women. They never think, oh, well, you know, something about a young woman doing that to a young boy, which is actually what happened recently in Britain. There was uh, a young boy who was, I think he was six when this started, and he was uh, raped and molested for about two years. And the woman who did it, I think she was uh, maybe 16 or 17 when this started, and um, they gave her a slap on the wrist for this because they said that she felt bad for having done this and then stopped. And it's for ridiculous. Getting caught. Yeah. Well, she said, uh, she said, oh, she, she felt, felt guilty, and then she stopped, and then they pers they decided to prosecute her later, and they said, well, oh, because she felt bad about it, and now she has a kid, they, they let her off, and it's ridiculous. You know, you know, one of the things that that I find really hilarious is that is that uh, when a woman uh, who is uh, on trial for any crime, when she has children, especially if she's a single mm -hmm. mother with children, um, she, yeah, she ends up having that be a mitigating circumstance or a uh, circumstance that's taken into consideration. She gets a shorter sentence than she otherwise would have, right? But men who are fathers, especially if they are single fathers get longer sentences than men who are not fathers. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? It is. I, it's just that there's a whole other side of this that they never look at. They never see, well you never see you know, young children, at least preteens and teens, as being sex offenders, at least not on the younger end of the spectrum, but it happens. And you know, Oh, it does. It does. It does. But when you know, when there's an older man involved, or especially, or an older woman, they think, well, you know, now they're the victim. You know, the one one thing I would say um, is that when yeah, it's well, boys, they will go. I after. I I do think like it, it's an extremely it's an extremely difficult. Yes. Yeah, but when it's boys, they will go after them. And there have been some news stories, and well, I cannot cite you know, off the top of my head, but I when think, I think boys, the entire... they, they don't worry so much about the age. No. When they're accusing a boy of something, they'll yeah. accuse right down into the elementary school years. Well, you know... Mm-hmm. Well, uh, yes, yes. The, the little boy who was in kindergarten or grade one and kissed his... Uh, girlfriend on the hand and got suspended for sexual harassment. Um, you know, you, you look at those types of things. Uh, you look even at a younger boy with an older girl playing doctor and often it's the boy who's going to take the rap for that. I think that, um, I don't think that this is a feminist uh, originating uh, sort of idea. I think that this has existed forever. Yeah. Um, as far as, you know, the, the men being 
uh, males being agents and women uh, and females being objects or moral patients. But, um, you know, like, again, I, I, feminists seem to have no problem acknowledging that there are male victims of rape and sexual assault as long as those male victims are victims of other males, right? Yeah. And the, the whole uh, attitude is 95% of the victims of rape are women and 98, 99% of the, the perpetrators are men, right? So they're okay. And even Mary Koss is totally okay with having men be victims of sexual assault and rape so long as the perpetrators are male. I don't think that this is necessarily a function of trying to conceal male victims just like feminists say, patriarchy hurts men too, right? It is actually, uh, it, they are clinging to the idea of uh, the male as perpetrator and uh, and the female as never perpetrator. So that that's really what I think is going on there. So, yeah, it, it's just, it, I, I don't, like, and how, how does that factor into their idea of rape culture, right? That they, you know, that all of these women get a slap on the wrist. All of these women uh, who do these bad things uh, get six months suspended sentence for, and then get awarded child support because the boy they raped when he was 15 uh, is now 18, and, and yeah, she's she's able to seek child support. Well, I think um, one of the reasons why this uh, the feminists still hold to this idea that men are essentially or rape is essentially a property of manhood uh, and masculinity um, or uh, social training that men get or whatever patriarchy is because they in order to be able to shame men and control them you really you really have to to shame their sexuality it's it's sort of a constant thing throughout history that men's sexuality has been shamed and controlled and and that's a, a way that you you develop your ability to control them. It's it's as simple as that. And 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 they will refuse to see any evidence to the contrary. They'll refuse to see the fact that actually rapists are a, are a tiny minority of men. Um, that they have a history of being abused themselves. Um, that they often are mentally ill. Um, and that also the there is a significant portion of female rapists. Um, in the world, and they just they just bulldoze over those facts because it isn't about actually doing anything about rape. It isn't about actually reducing the number of rapes in the world, or the number of victims, um, or do something to help the victims and the perpetrators. It really is just about controlling men. And I could get into a conversation of why I think these these particular women are so obsessed with controlling men. But that's probably for another day, because I, I can see that Hannah wants to speak, so I'm going to let her go forward and do that. Hello, one thing I wanted to point out, because we keep talking about um, we keep talking about victimization of youth and victimization by youth, and and one of the things that has really kind of blown my mind in the overall discussion is it that I haven't heard any feminist advocacy to establish a unified age of consent. And they they fought tooth and nail for all kinds of other standards uh, related to consent, related to who can and cannot have sex, who can and cannot be legally considered to consent. But when it comes to making sure an adult knows, you know, what age they are not allowed to be with, there isn't this major push. There may have been some discussion here and there. But they certainly haven't started a you know teach adults when the age of consent begins campaign or even a, a, a major letter writing campaign where they've asked Congress to you know in the United States to establish an age of consent and in the United States it's really bad if you go if you're in Ohio it's 16 years old if you're in California it's 18 years old and and the um, one of the family members of a friend of mine recently gave legal permission to her daughter who was under 16 to marry an adult and move to a southern state and the marriage is legal in that state 
Um, the, the sex is considered within the marriage is considered consensual in that state, even though that state's age of consent is higher than the age of the bride because the parent gave, a, gave permission. And it just seems like the most convoluted and ridiculous thing. So, so this, this situation that this guy is in basically now is that if his, his wife decides to divorce him later on, she can accuse him of raping her for the first year of their marriage. And he's, he's, uh, he's really not that much older than her. And so you know, we're stuck in this situation where traveling through the United States, you get different messages in different areas. One area you get told that if somebody's well, three I, weeks before had... their 18th birthday, they can't consent. And in another area, somebody could be 15 years old and they can What message does that send? Well, I've I've actually heard I've actually heard of feminists uh, advocating for a universal age of consent, and in one case, it was uh, people involved uh, with Harriet Harman and uh, some other members of the Labour Party in the UK. Uh, they were working for a human rights organization that was all affiliated with a uh, known pedophile organization. And they were trying to lower the age of consent to age four. And I have also heard of Simone de Beauvoir after she lost her job for seducing numerous uh, underage female students of hers into liaisons with herself and uh, her lover, uh, Star Trek, right? Uh, her and a bunch of other intellectuals uh, trying to abolish age of consent laws altogether. So, you know, uh, feminists have actually, uh, at least on an individual basis, been in favor of normalizing or, or, or uh, generalizing age of consent laws, but not in the direction that you would think. So, Not yeah. to protect potential victims. <laughs> no. no, not at all. Not at all. But uh, um, oh, okay. sorry, Rachel. Rachel. Off to you. Oh, just uh, <laughs> just really quick, because I know we're trying to wrap things up. But um, with the age of consent, it is a real problem because sometimes they do use that to trap uh, young men, especially young teenage boys. You know, if they're with somebody who is about, you know, say, a couple years difference, you know, they can use that to lock them up in prison. I mean, well, the parents of the girl, if they find out, or if it ends up on on you, well, not YouTube. If it ends up on the internet and someone finds out, you know, they can. And also, if you take a picture, an underage picture of yourself, you can end up uh, getting arrested for distribution of child pornography. All depend, all depending upon uh, age of consent laws. So, you know, you'd think that they would work on that. They don't. <laughs> you would think. Yeah, they don't. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, let's uh, just, uh, I just wanted to put it out there that it's pretty, it's actually it's sort of an interesting situation that Rain has, has spoken out against feminist rape laws, or sorry, feminist rape culture, the concept of feminist yeah. rape culture. I mean, that's really, it's certainly the tide seems to be turning. I mean, we've had our run-ins with rape in the past, or sorry, Rain, not rape, sorry, Rain in the past over their definition, they're very narrow definition of rape, which excludes most of the male victims of rape, but, um, and then basing statistics on rape on that, and the, the, the distortion that sort of propagates um, through the, the ranks on who is getting raped and who's doing the raping, um, and what's important to focus on. But in this instance, they're actually, actually calling out the feminists and feminist rape culture for creating misinformation around rape, and uh, and even impeding the process of addressing it as a social problem is like a big step forward. Um, that they would actually put their neck on the line like that, and um, you know, props to them for that. You know, yeah. good job, Rain. Right? Good on them. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's excellent that uh, they're going forward with that. And uh, I mean, we'll we'll keep bitching at them about the made to penetrate thing, of course, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> because um, we're hard what, to realizing what, rape is male behavior. What I wanted to ask is whether Raven Moon Dragon has any help tonight. <laughs> Raven Moon Dragon, well, she might have something else to say. 
Let's 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 just ask her. Okay. All right. Great. I think I think that um well you know I don't really have a problem with rain. I I actually like rain. It's on my port uh, my no, my uh, my profile on OK Cupid that I like rain and pina coladas and <laughs> and I, I like um, making love at midnight and on the and, shores of the bay. <laughs> right? So, uh, excuse me, sister of Labias. What? What? On the shores of the bay, if you like them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, I think rain is good and it makes the flowers grow. And hopefully we'll get some rain right here instead of snow. There's a lot of snow. But, you know, rain is a good thing. It is. And so I support rain. I do. Um, and, but I don't support patriarchy. Patriarchy is bad. But, um, yeah. <laughs> and, and thank you to everybody who's been watching us because that's nice. But, you know, watch in a good way, not watch in a non-objectifying way because you know, watching in an objectifying way, it makes us be, it makes us become objects because that's <laughs> how men's brains, they project out and apply themselves to women somehow, you know? If they apply themselves to women and then, then, and then a woman becomes an object and that's a bad thing and you shouldn't do it. But but do watch. We really appreciate you watching in a good way, in good ways, not bad watching, but good watching. And and also, I would like to thank everybody else who helps us out in creating these broadcasts. Um, I would like to thank Europa for his art, which is good art. It's good art. It's not bad art. It's not the kind of art that makes you feel like you're an object. It's the kind of art that makes you feel really pretty. And I would also like to thank Phil for doing the animations for our radio show and James for always helping me out producing our radio show. <laughs> and I would like to thank the people at A Voice for Men um, for, for, for uh, hosting our radio shows. And they, they tell me, the people at A Voice for Men tell me that they are pro-equality. So I like them because they're a feminist organization, um, because they're pro-equality. That, you see that? The feminists are pro-equality, so obviously a voice for men is a feminist organization, so I like them. Oh and they seem to like me too. Um, yeah, and we get along really well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I also like to thank donors because I like money. And yeah, um, I think that that's about it. Um, oh, Olivia, sister Karen, do you do you want to to close off the the, the hangout? <laughs> <laughs> that was a really good speech, Raven. It sounds like a sensual. Ladies, Karen, I believe you're still alive. No, I, I think, I, I think you said all that needs to be said. Wow. Um. Oh. Just wow. Um. I'm crying. Here, Rachel, you got to... <laughs> I, I just, I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to suppress your feminine energies, but I think you need to turn the show off. Turn! <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. That's it. That's it for us. We're signing off. And uh, everybody, uh, thanks for supporting us. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Bye-bye.